Call to order the town council meeting for February 6, 2013. If everyone would rise and join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our meetings are recorded electronically. Uh, we go by an agenda. If anyone wishes to speak tonight, we ask you to come over here and sign in over at the table there. And if anyone ha wanted to have something on the agenda for tonight's meeting, they should have had it uh, to us by the last Wednesday at 3 o'clock of the month um, to have on the agenda for this meeting. Uh, approval of minutes from the January 2nd, 2013 minutes. I'll make, been... a mo make a motion to approve the minutes. We have a motion by Councilman Nall, second by Councilman Paulsgrove, to approve the minutes from the January 2nd, 2013 meeting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? <coughs> so carried. Reports, Council Committees, Public Works, Councilman Farkas isn't here. Uh, just want to say that the uh, uh, Public Works guys have been doing an outstanding job uh, salting the roads. Uh, there hadn't been a whole lot of plowing, I don't think, but been salting it, and uh, um, I think they've been doing an outstanding job. So just relay that, if you will, Frank. Um, you'll talk about the purchase in your report? Sure. Truck. Yes. All right. Uh, Water and Sewer, Councilman Paulsgrove. Well, it seems like the town manager has quite a few water and sewer issues in his report, so I don't think I need to add anything to that, so we'll wait for his report. All righty. Public safety, Councilman Nall. I'll start with the Planning Commission first. I have no, no new updates for the Planning Commission. Uh, still working on the, uh, on the zoning. Uh, so obviously we didn't make the uh, our goal of the first of the year, but uh, we'll be pulling together fairly fairly soon here now after the first of the year, and I'll defer to Deputy Towson for his report on public safety. All right. Thank you. Economic development, Councilwoman Schultz. Nothing new to report. No. All righty. Um, community enhancement, Councilman Pierce. Uh, nothing to report other than the fact that uh, I think Frank had reported last time that the. Uh, little box thing that we have people coming to look for the uh, geocache. geocache 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 thing um, I do see quite a few people down there so they have found it and we're keeping it stocked and so forth so that's just part of uh, but no one knows where it is oh yeah okay. they found it <laughs> <laughs> all righty any questions or comments for the council and committee reports community deputy mark Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Sheriff's Office handled a total of 95 incidents for the month. Out of those incidents, um, I just want to bring light to one of them. The, uh, there was a burglary on, the, uh, on January 16th around 4 p.m., 100 block of Blue Ridge Avenue. Uh, the victim's residence was entered um, through a locked rear door by uh, someone pried open the door, went inside and removed um, a couple of antique items. Um, Two of those being an antique clock and a brass lamp uh, valued at over $800. Um, we believe by um, the amount of time that was there that this person obviously knew uh, the victim. And they, they went in, went out, knew what they had. And um, so we believe it was somebody that knew, knew them. So um, what I'm getting at is um, basically you want to call if you see anything suspicious. We did note 10 of those such calls for suspicious vehicle and subject. So it's great that everybody's calling when they see something because it might be something so minor that it may be a real big clue for whatever we're working on or it could be something that could happen beforehand, you know, you, that you could stop. So um, we definitely want to do that. Uh, other than that, it's uh, January is usually a quiet month. So thankfully we live in a quiet town and, you know, warmer months are ahead and that's usually when crime spikes up again. So. Just keep our eyes open, and um, we're still working on this one ca on the case I just described. Uh, another deputy's assigned to it, but I've been helping him along with it, so we'll see see how it goes. 
if anybody hears me anything, I know I'm going to probably check, I'm sure he's already checked some antique stores, because the problem is a lot of the antique stores aren't in the pawn shop database, so it's more of a manual thing. You've got to go around and ask and things, so we'll see what happens. Any questions, everyone? Thank you, Mark. Right, you Mark, I just want to, you know, he's, Mark gives us our, his report on number of incidents every month, and I was looking back in my notes. You know, we've been well under, we've been under 100 incidents now for the last couple months, and mm -hmm. It hadn't been that long ago. We were over 160. Yes, sir. Uh, 150, 160 incidents, and I think that that speaks volumes for Mark and the effort he's doing in town to uh, uh, you know keep things running smoothly. So I appreciate your help, Mark. Yeah, I can assure you, if if we didn't have a presence in town, I can assure you, Abs that absolutely. It, whether it be me or another deputy, we would have a lot more problems. I mean, with the town ordinances and the town council, <coughs> of course, as I've said in the past, work good hand in hand with me when I have a problem. And you assign whatever it's good cooperation and, and as a result between that and us we yep. we we do enjoy a low crime yep. rate Absolutely. and hopefully it continues. Yep. Good job. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. West Carroll Rec Council. Just in time. which last year we had one and a half. Some girls played two teams. So um, that's really good. And that's really all I had. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions for the Red Council? When did your baseball registration begin? You offhand? They, um, they have registration, and I believe it practice starts the okay, end of uh, February, February, beginning of March. So it's still cold. But yeah, there was yeah. a sign up on the corner. Registration. Yeah, I didn't know when it was when it ended. Okay, good. All right. Thank Congratulations you. on your your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Fire Chief Reporter, Chief Tom Coe. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, January we ran uh, 17 calls for fire rescue response and 54 calls for EMS response. Uh, obviously, with the colder weather, we've seen a spike in motor vehicle collisions. We just want to encourage everyone, uh, especially on the hill going out of town on 31 towards Frederick, just to use caution with the ice and uh, drive carefully. Uh, in January, the department held its uh, annual banquet. It was our 64th banquet. I'd like to thank Mayor Rook for his kind words and thank the town and the council for their uh, generous donation that allows us to keep going. Well, there's a few members here tonight that uh, were recognized at our banquet. Uh, we recognize members for career response plateaus, so the numbers of responses that they've had, both fire and EMS, over their years of service. Uh, this year we awarded, uh, let's see here, Jack Coe for um, making the 3,000 fire call plateau for 3,050. Uh, Dale Lohman reached the 3,500 fire call plateau with uh, 3,566. Uh, Councilman Ed Posgrove reached life member status, so he's been an active member for 30 years, and we thank him for that. And uh, Jack Coe received a special reward, award this year for 50 years of active service to the department. So uh, it's really only been 25. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was a very nice evening to uh, where we were able to honor several members. Aside from that, uh, things are relatively slow at the fire station. We've got bingo every Tuesday night and our breakfast the first Sunday of the month, so. Could you just say one more time how many years your dad's been a mem member? 50. Of 50. 50. Now, now I'm not, not going there with that, so don't keep that hand down. But, but out of those 50 years, how many years have you been treasurer? 50 years. 45. 45, and, and that's something you just don't hear about. Uh, somebody that dedicated to be treasurer of anything, uh, but in the, especially with the fire service, that the way it's changed uh, over the last 50 years. I mean, the treasurer job probably didn't take that much time. Now it's almost a full-time job. So 
uh, the Jack, Dale, and Ed, congratulations. Thank you for your service to the community. <laughs> Town Manager, Frank. If you want to follow along, you can turn to tab five in your notebooks. Um, the first item we're gonna talk about is our water tank painting project. Um, the, the painting of the tank is actually complete. However, as, as we discussed at the last work session, one section of the tank uh, turned dull, what they call flashing, uh, got caught. Uh, they thought the temperatures and conditions were right, but it was a little bit too, humi too humid that day. So they'll need to come back and, and recoat that one section. It's about a half a day or six to eight hours worth of work. Um, we have uh, temporarily suspended work on the tank until we get a good stretch of weather. Um, the tank was refilled on the 29th and the 30th, so it is now full of water. We took a set test sample on the 31st of January, and as soon as we get back satisfactory results on bacteria, uh, then that tank will be coming back online. So we're actually the tank will be in service even though we have to do that. And then uh, when we get a get a run of weather, we'll have a uh, contractor has nine working days to complete uh, to complete the job. So uh, they're you know they're well aware of what their their obligations are. Uh, the pumping stations, you know, that was in uh, the review process with the Rural Utility Service on their loan. Um, we've completed the, what's called the state clearinghouse process, which is where state agencies review the proposal, and uh, that came back with no unfavorable comments. Uh, I anticipate that we should get our complete review comments within the next, uh, next week or so, and then uh, ARA will be addressing those and we'll get, should have approval on both the preliminary engineering and the environmental assessment. As you may recall, we actually have the engineering drawings and permits to do that, and we're going through this process in the, in the endeavor to get a loan through the Euro, uh, USDA's Rural Utility Service Program uh, to fund that. Um, Hurricane Sandy, a little bit of follow-up. I have uh, had some contact from FEMA, uh, and we'll, they'll be setting up a meeting in the near future. I don't have a date yet to review our submittal on the expenses that we incurred uh, during that storm, which we're, not, we're, we're just really um, our uh, labor costs, uh, salary cut figures. We didn't have any damages or expenses uh, beyond that. Uh, the Lions Park Playground, uh, the plans and specs have been uh, reviewed with the Carroll County Recreation and Parks and they're, they're okay with them. Uh, the project bid will be out this month. Uh, meanwhile, our public works staff has uh, been at work over there. I don't know if you've been by. All the equipment's been removed. Uh, all the um, ground cover has, some of it's been removed, some of it's just been piled up and I don't know how much stone is there, but there must be like 16 or <laughs> inches of stone. It must have been free. Mm. <laughs> so we'll, we're going to move that around, regrade that a little bit to try and make the whole site a little more level uh, so that when the, the project is bid, then they'll have a, a more level surface to work with. Now, has that project been sent to the state yet, or are you waiting for the bid? Well, we're in a we're in an uh, interesting situation where I'm transferring funds from leftover from other projects. So that portion of it I'm still working on and getting that submittal in. Part of that funding is already approved right. from before, so the answer to that is kind of a split. Uh, okay. Half is, half isn't. But I've been, in, I finally got some good direction from the uh, the lady that uh, runs that, and uh, understand exactly what we have to do. And it's a matter of going through process. Uh, it's not a matter of whether it'll do it; it's just a matter of going through process. Okay. Um, the water system controls. Uh, you know, we've been working with Control Systems 21 to develop um, the control system. They've I've been building the control panels. Uh, you guys know, may recall that's going to be a radio frequency system that'll operate uh, out of the, the main frequency, uh, the main, or rather the main uh, antenna will be up on the pedestal tank, and then we'll have a control uh, center down into wastewater plant, and we'll be controlling our water system uh, from uh, from that. So they had to get uh, build these uh, control panels. They they think they'll have that done and be actually in the installation process in the next uh, two to three weeks. So that project's moving along. Um, some of the things that, uh, unexpected things that happened uh, this month, uh, during the standpipe painting, we happened, became aware that there were some gaps uh, on the pedestal tank, the new tank, where the geodesic uh, roof uh, came down and sat on the side walls of the tank and creating gaps, spaces up there, which you don't want that. Uh, so it happened that MBA, who was doing the uh, tank inspections for the pedestal tank project. We hired them to go up and do a actual do inspection to see what they found, and they found that baffle, there's some baffles that run on the inside were uh, had been buckled up uh, 
pushing them up and away from the tank to create these gaps. Uh, we followed that up with um, a call to Mid-Atlantic Tank, uh, who are the ones that, that put that tank up, and they've had their, their folks come by and take a look. And what they feel happened is that um, the ice buildup on the inside of the tank, when that broke loose, those, sl those slabs of ice shot up uh, and caught these baffles and pushed them up and buckled them. Uh, they've seen that. They describe conditions much worse than we have. Uh, so um, in any case, we need to get that, um, get that fixed because we can't have these gaps because it lets debris and things potentially go into the tank. So uh, we have a price of $5,100, and what that will require is I'm going to have to get a, a very high lift, about a 120-foot high lift to come in there. I don't really want to be in that. <laughs> Got all the way to the top of the tank, pull those baffles out as best they can, and then attach some screens along the outside of the tank uh, to prevent them from uh, stuff from going into it. Operationally, we need to look at how we operate the tank um, and lower that water level a little bit in the wintertime so if you have, when you have these ice chunks break loose, they can't get up there. Uh, so maybe we are gonna have to, I guess it's a learning experience and it's not something that's been experienced before, but they Frank, were- is that, is that something that you'll be able to control with the new control system? You'll be able to adjust the water level? We're, we've, Jack and I have been having some pretty good discussions about that. We need to, uh, <clears throat> the one thing that we seem to be lacking is a, a, a good uh, control point on the tank level uh, up there, a, a good pressure control reader, a good transducer. So we're trying to find a place to put a good transducer that would read that tank pressure. We have one, but it's in the, it's in the, the manifold that supplies the water to the pipe, to the tank, and it doesn't, give the, it doesn't give a reading because when the pumps are running and things like that, you get the pressure from the pumps interfering. And, so we need to find a, so if we can find that right point and get that transducer in, yes, we can control it. Because then it would just be a matter of sending a signal to the control and saying we want that pressure point to be this instead of this, and you just adjust it. So the answer to that is yes, we're gonna, yes, we're gonna try and do that. Okay. Um, Dealman in, we had talked about, there was discussion about having some volunteers perhaps come and paint that. Uh, so we thought it'd be a good idea to get a, a lead paint assessment. Well, we did. Uh, the, the whole thing is covered in lead paint. Um, it's flaking very badly. So, I mean, if you were going to paint it, you really couldn't paint it the way it is because the paint would just be flaking right off. Um, and to remove the flaking uh, would require you have a licensed uh, person that, you know, and, and that has a license and is familiar with the lead abatement removal process. So um, I don't know where that takes your thinking on this, but it's, you know, it's not going to be a case of just getting some volunteers to come and brush off the paint and, and start paint. My, my neighbor does that for a living, so I'll check with him. Okay. Uh, the lagoon remediation, um, I submitted an application to MDE for a, you know, a water quality administration financing uh, loan. Um, at, on the application, I used a, a, loan, a project amount of $1.5 million and asked for $800,000. You, know, you might recall we had an estimate of 1.25 million just to remove the sludge. Uh, we had uh, about 700,000 uh, that we'd gotten from uh, towards the project already. It'll be several months until we know. I'm not real positive that we're going to get anything out of this. As you might recall, our pumping stations, which I thought were a pretty pretty good project, you know, were like 140th out of 150 on the list. So. I'm not sure the lagoons are going to do much better, but it's a step we, we should take, and we'll find out in a little bit. Uh, some, more, some more interesting bad news. Uh, utility pump station. Uh, down at the wastewater treatment plant, there's um, a utility water system, which basically takes wastewater that's been treated, and you, you pump that through a utility system, and you use that for wash down and things like that at the, at the, on the wastewater plant. Um, well, the, there's a little pump station that, that energizes that. Well, the, what happened is the heater in the little, little pump station went out sometime during this cold spell, and uh, both of the pumps in there just cracked wide open. So um, the pump station itself is, has been kind of problematic. It hasn't worked as well as, 
as, as all that it has a problem with getting airbound. Um, and uh, so what we're doing is we're simply, we're just simply going to hook the utility water system to our potable town's water supply and bypass that pump station for the time being. And um, maybe at some time in the future we can reconfigure and, and, and go back to using that. But for right now, it seems like a better solution than to spend as much or more money just putting pumps back in there and still having the same, the same issue. So um, we're working with uh, HDI, who's the town's utility contractor, and the price for that's about $6,700. So that, uh, some more good news. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we did get the third booster pump installed up at the at the Snader booster station, uh, which is the one that sends water across town. You know, we had two in there, and usually should, we should have three, which that gives us a level of redundancy we'd like to have. So we should be in good shape there with uh, that. Um, you asked about the truck. Uh, we did get the truck delivered. Was it last Friday? It's so <laughs> I think it was last Friday we finally got the truck delivered. And the, the way that shook out was, you know, we had gotten the bids, uh, but the the, um, the delivery times were six to eight weeks. And then, uh, so I contacted uh, Criswell, who uh, has the state contract for trucks. They were a little bit lower by, by about a couple thousand dollars, but their delivery time was 120 days, so we would not have gotten the truck until, you know, four months from now. So I went back to the low better, which was Want Chevrolet, and said, what can you find uh, in a truck that's comparable to what we, what we bid? And they came back with a truck, and the only thing that was lacking was the power uh, options on the, on the <coughs> doors, door locks and windows. And that, product, that truck came, actually came in about $1,500 cheaper than, than what we'd spec. So, and they were able to deliver that in two weeks. So we, we went with that option. So we actually were able to get the truck delivered uh, and it's on the road uh, for $36,000. And in the meanwhile, uh, there was a lot of interest in our old truck, much more than I had imagined. So we originally were going to trade it in. They were going to allow us $2,000. But uh, we decided just to go ahead and, and post it for bids, did that, and we got uh, $4,250 for it. So we recovered the $1,000 we had to spend <laughs> to fix the other enough to keep it running for a couple of weeks and still came out a little bit ahead uh, on what the trade-in what the value would have been. So that's, that's the news on the truck. Good. Are there any questions on anything? Any questions? Frank, Frank, does the, uh, does MES check the, uh, like, down at the pump station? I mean, is there a way that we should have known that we lost heat down there? Um, I mean, it just didn't happen. I would think it just happened overnight. I, I they're, they're really not... They're really not employed to be our maintenance crews per se, but they will do things like that. I just think it was something that somehow it got overlooked. I, I don't have a good explanation for how that whether you know I understand the heater was working and it wasn't working. Uh, all I know <coughs> is the heater doesn't work, uh, the unit froze, and, and that's the end of that. Uh, but I mean, we, if, if you if you look at our arrangement with MES, they're 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 there to you know run the plants. You know, do the sampling, uh, things like that. But they will. You know, if we say check something, they'll they'll well, do I mean, that. I, I think if they're in the plant, they would be yeah. simple enough to walk but, I mean, around and uh, to, to to typically look inside that pump station to see where the heater was running. No, I mean if there was an alarm or something like that, they would react to the alarm. Uh, but uh, so I mean, I guess that's something we can look at whether we could set up a some some SOPs. Let's say we're looking at that unit every day. Um, I mean, yeah, even at that, we get yeah. the guys from Public Works to stop in one, yeah. you know, once a day and yeah. walk through if nobody else is doing it. Yeah. I, I guess that leads to another question. Are there other places of vulnerability within the plant that should have some <coughs> kind of temperature sensors or alarms or something like that? Well, we found out, we, I think we, we got lucky, and I'll, I'll start talking about this, and Jack can tell you more. Our, uh, the, during that same time frame, the, uh, the grit removal uh, equipment uh, froze up for us. Um, and that was something that we had a lot of discussion about during the time the plant was being built and whether, whether what we should do with that in cold weather. And they, they, we were given pretty clear responses that those things set outside and much more serious conditions than we do have and don't freeze up. 
but ours did. So um, we ended up getting some tarps, um, you know, draping them over them. Jack was, you know, once again jumped into the jumped into the breach and saved us, and uh, got uh, you know some uh, propane heaters and, and blew he hot air in there until we we thawed it out. Now I think what we've done now is we we set it on a time a time system that it runs every hour, uh, regardless. Uh, so we'll you know prevent that from happening again. But um, yeah, there's there's that. Um, I mean, I guess anywhere in the plant where we if we were to lose in the in the digesters themselves, there's enough aerobic activity and movement of water that you might get freezing along the sides, but you're not going to get a freeze up. You know, perhaps in the wet well, uh, you, know, you get something like that. Uh, you know, for some reason, both pumps were to go out, uh, you could lose you could lose uh, lose power or something. Um, I guess anywhere there where there's a you know a pipe that comes out and goes up and we have these heat tapes on them, uh, which are you know keeping them uh, from freezing, we could have issues there. And we have some of that. I mean, you have some places where pipes they have to come up, they have to run on the outside to get to the top of the digesters and things like that. But they're wrapped in insulation. They have heat. They have heat on them. So I guess any of those kind of places could ultimately be a vulnerability. Those are alarms. Are there alarms? Okay, I guess my point is I just wonder if there's other places that we need to look at and have sensors or alarms or whatever, and maybe they're part of this new control system that or could physical, be incorporated into physical it. physical look at it or something, you know, once yeah, a day. something. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's our staff or MES. Yeah. I, we can talk, we can sit okay. down and come up with maybe some SO, cold weather SOPs. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the the um, the failure of the heater and the and the pump utility pump uh, that's that's just bad luck. The other one, you know, we were, we talked about that a lot, mm -hmm. and we were pretty well assured that that wouldn't happen. That these machines would just you know grind through or something. I don't know what, but I remember those conversations. It it it, it froze up pretty solid. So it's a design issue. So what do they have a response to it? Oh, I didn't bother with. Going back to the engineers at this at this point, we d we dealt with it in a way that, that we could. Uh, I think that if we keep the timer running at half hour, on hour intervals, you know, it should never freeze uh, to the point that the unit wouldn't wouldn't turn. I mean, if it gets that cold, you know, maybe we'll just have to run it in a continuous mode or something like that. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. Frank, the uh, we had a visit with the Ripken Group. Any report on that or We're still under discussions, and that's all I'd like to say at this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's not on the agenda, but uh, two things here. One is the clerk treasury report. Donna? I'm going to start every month now uh, giving an update just on our expenses for general fund and our enterprise fund so that, I mean, it is public knowledge, so everyone's aware of um, what we're spending and where we are in the budget. And tonight also I want to bring up about the election because that's coming up in May. So, Council, you have reports in your book, so if you want to turn to uh, tab four. And our expenses under the general side for the month of January were $48,502.01. Uh, majority of that uh, was for um, the Carroll County Commissioners, which was our quarterly billing for uh, our deputy service. And that was 22930 And then we did a donation for the uh, fire department, which was already mentioned earlier tonight. Any questions on the general fund report by the council for the expenses? Nope. And then on our enterprise uh, side, our grand total for the month of January was uh, two hundred eighty-nine thousand five hundred and thirty-seven dollars and fifteen cents, which sounds like a lot, and it is. And the majority of that was because that was our loan payments that were due for our MDE 
loans that we have for the various projects, and that was $167,540. So that was the major portion of that. Um, we also had an expense of almost $9,000 to uh, Maryland for the Revenue Administration Division, which is our uh, flush tax, our bay tax that we collect on your bills. And every quarter we have to forward that along to the state. And council, you have any questions on the expense side for nope. the enterprise? Okay. And anybody in the uh, audience have a question? Well, election is coming up in May, and it will be for the mayor and two council seats. Information is already out on the town website. Uh, just a couple dates I want to throw out to you. Um, the nomination forms are available at the town hall or on the website. You can print those off if you're interested in running. And the last day to file for the nominations will be April the 8th. You have to be in by that date. You uh, must be a registered voter, of course, and that has to be, um, the last day for that is April the 1st. Now, we do have the forms if you are not a registered voter, and you can pick those up at the town hall, or you can get them right from the election board in Westminster. Election date is May 14th, which is a Tuesday. And that's about all I have, unless anybody has any questions. A couple of things, Donna. Sure. Requirements to be a voter six months in town? Uh, I, I knew you were going to ask me that, and I don't, I don't have the... Um, yes, yes, you must have be a registered voter in the state of Maryland. Um, you have to have lived in the town for six months, at least six months. And to run one year? I'm sorry? To run for office? Yes. Is it one year, I believe? Right. Yeah. One. Yes, it's one. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And the election will be? <coughs> no. At it will be one. held here, community room. Okay. Uh, polls are open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that's not on the agenda is mayor's report. Um, I met with, uh, talk, talk to you, um, about our Memorial Day service last month. Uh, we have uh, um, Jim Getty, who portrays Abraham Lincoln, uh, coming down. Uh, it will be the Sunday, the day before uh, Memorial Day. Um, it will be on the grounds of the Presbyterian Church. In case of bad weather, we'll be inside the church. Uh, we're having it on the Presbyterian Church grounds this year and due to the fact that uh, this is the 150th anniversary of the Battle of, Get of, Battle of Gettysburg, and two uh, Union soldiers who fought in that battle and came through New Windsor died of exhaustion here in town and are buried in the cemetery, so I thought it would be appropriate. Um, I met with uh, Frank Badovic and Doris Pierce uh, a couple weeks ago to kind of put our heads together and come up with some things, and I think it's going to be a great day. We're going to try to incorporate the middle school uh, for the eighth grade to have a essay contest of uh, basically what it, the essay will be based on life um, in Carroll County in 1863. Um, and then also I talked to uh, uh, the principal over at uh, um, Prince Scott Key, uh, John Walker, and uh, he has agreed to work with us to have uh, an art contest and a photography contest uh, for with the bat with the uh, Gettysburg Battle and the uh, Civil War theme. So um, we'll have more details on that probably in another two weeks. Uh, Friday, I went to uh, Carroll County Department of Economic. Uh, they had a Main Street committee meeting and uh, got some ideas that uh, I want to look into before I shoot them out to the council on trying to. Uh, improve our economic development here in New Windsor. Also made a trip to Annapolis last month to uh, see whether or not I could get some support for uh, additional funding and also uh, maybe some 
waivers with MDE, which we're not sure we really want to pursue at this time with the uh, wastewater treatment plant or the lagoon remediation. So, uh, but they are they are aware of our needs and uh, our projects uh, coming up in the future. Also attended the uh, Commissioner Howard's and Commissioner Shoemaker's uh, around the county in 80 minutes the other week over at Frank Scott Key. Um, it was very interesting uh, where they went to. Uh, Councilman Nall went with me, and uh, it's very interesting to see where the county is heading and uh, what their priorities are. Um, one one thing is uh, that they're not shooting for just okay services, but they're looking for excellent service uh, for the residents of Carroll County. So uh, I commend the two commissioners for having those uh, county in 80 minutes. Um, any questions for me, Mayor? Okay, good. Residents concerns. <laughs> Any residents concerns? Anybody have anything? No? All right. Old business? Any old business? None? New business. Pay <clears throat> restoration fund, financial hardship, waiver policy. We turn to half seven. The, um, the Maryland Department of the Environment sent us a notice uh, in January, uh, reminding us that the uh, with the recent uh, change to the uh, Bay Restoration Fund and, and HB HB 466, uh, which increased the uh, increased the amount of the Bay Restoration Fund effective July, <clears throat> there was a requirement that the um, <clears throat> Water and Sewer Billing Authorities establish a uh, an exemption or for residential users uh, on the basis of financial hardship. So they sent a reminder that we needed to get that, uh, that done and to have that to them uh, by the end of February. So uh, with that being the case, um, did a little research talk with MML and contacted some of our uh, towns and looked at the uh, uh, criteria. And basically, um, the, the bill requires to develop, uh, the, the billing authorities to develop a, uh, a waiver plan for low-income uh, households. And uh, there was four criteria. Uh, you had to meet two of those criteria uh, to qualify. And the criteria one is receive energy assistance subsidy, receive a public assistance supplemental income uh, food stamps, receive veterans or Social Security disability, or be meet the household income criteria uh, as set forth by um, Maryland Department of Human Resources. Um, <clears throat> so basically, we've developed a, a form that uh, sets out how to apply, and that uh, someone who wants this uh, particular waiver would provide this information um, on the form that we provide. And then they would submit that to the town, and then the town would either concur or not concur with that, that particular waiver request. Um, we're following, uh, you know, we're following the form that, you know, some other towns have used, so I, I don't see there should be any particular issue with this. So we'll administer <laughs> this? We have to administer it, yeah. So I would ask, I would ask for your uh, <coughs> concurrence tonight on this, uh, I don't, wouldn't, I don't know if it would be a policy, I don't think it's just a procedure. I, I think, yeah, it's, program. it's, it's mandatory you know, that yeah. you establish some sort of procedure, so it's the procedure you establish. Yeah. So I just ask your concurrence on that, and then I'll forward that on the MDE, and I, I don't think there'll be any, uh, any more on that. Well, just, I mean, you can vote that the form is fine. I mean, that's just what we have to do. Yeah. I'll, I'll make a motion that, that the town adopts the uh, residential application for Bay Restoration Fee Hardship. <clears throat> Second. We have a motion by Councilman Nall, seconded by Councilman Paulsgrove to... Uh, approve the application for the Bay Restoration Fund financial hardship waiver policy. Any questions or comments? Frank, uh, uh, since we're required to administer this, do we then have to forward all this information on to the state to make sure that it meets their criteria? Well, uh, <clears throat> they've kind of, uh, the way I get it, they've kind of passed that, that buck on to the billing authority. Which I, I found interesting that if they wanted the, if they wanted the billing authority to do something and this were the criteria, why they didn't just give us the the why we had to come up with our own form form 
why didn't they just give us the form and everything and that. everyone would have the same? I, I, I assume that, you know, if, if the town wanted to, maybe they could throw some other criteria in there that was unique to their situation. But, um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to administer it. Um, I, I assume that if we do this, we'll pass that along. I know that from time to time our, our clerk has had some, you know, interaction with folks down there on, on, on these things. So I would forward it along uh, to them. So, so if a resident applies for this and we grant it, then when we submit our quarterly billing, we say we had two exemptions this time or what? Yeah. And then we wouldn't, but that when we would bill, we would not include that on that particular uh, person's bill. They would be, okay. you know, where it says, if you look at your bill, there's a, you know, accounting for that would be a, that would be a zero. So as long as we have the documentation for an audit, we're all right. Mm -hmm. So then when we submit our payment to the state, after mm -hmm. having billed it, we just submit it minus those exemptions. Right. Oh, Frank, if you the, don't, I mean, they, like I said, it's, <laughs> there wasn't an abundance of, of information. It, yes, if sir. If you don't qualify for these things, right. how does that impact the individual property owner? What do you, well, I'm not sure. If you if you you have to qualify, you have to have meet two of these criteria to get the exemption, which means you would not have to pay the fifteen dollars oh, per okay. quarter. If you don't meet it, then you'll have to pay the fifteen dollars. Okay. That's right. What, okay, That's just the restoration. I, part. I believe, from what I read, that the person who is the, the bill recipient has to meet the criteria. Right. Right. So that if the owner of a building meet, does not meet those criteria, even if the tenants of the building might, from what I read, and because anytime you're dealing with this, with anytime you're dealing with the government, but certainly the state, these things are in flux for a while until they're actually working, you know, the way everybody expects them to. Uh, I don't know that the property owner gets an exemption because one of the tenants might get, might be. Okay, I don't know if I understood the councilman's question. But I, I think that's a good point. Yeah, and I, that's how I read it. Yeah. Is that the applicant is the person who pays the bill. Yeah. Who owns the property. So do I understand it? It's currently, it went from seven fifty to fifteen. Yeah, in July, in July, it went from seven fifty right. to fifteen dollars per right. quarter. Right. So if you qualify for one of these four things, two you're still or any two of them. Yeah. You, you would still continue to pay the seven fifty, but not the fifteen. No, no. I believe you're, you're exempted, exempted entirely. Exempted exempted away from entirely. It. Okay. All right. It amounts to sixty dollars a year. I have two questions for you, Frank. One is, how often does this form have? Is that a resident turns this form in once and done, or no? I'm, I'm sorry. I should have pointed that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I should have oh, okay. pointed so out. So this every year one the year. Person has to re resubmit the form. One year. And how are we communicating this to the residents? Was it in the newsletter? Well, if we get, if we actually get someone who, who submits an exemption and, and, and then we and grant that, that would be noted right. in, in that. But how do they know about, how do they know they, how, do they, how they know, know about this program? How would they know? They won't. They won't, once, unless once they're they paying well, attention. So, so it's going to be the newspaper. Yeah. No. I mean, no. it's, it's, yeah. We, we, sh we should send something out, too. Yeah. I mean, we could, well, I mean, we obviously we can cover this in our newsletter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I, I, my guess is that programs that deal with folks that are in these circumstances are probably going to make their their clients make them aware of it. Aware of it. All right. So we'll put it in the next newsletter. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, like so my, my awareness of it started, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. When we got the email. All right. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? So carry. Any other new business? Announcements? Uh, pancake breakfast is February or March 3rd, 7 to 12, down to Windsor Station at the Fire Hall. Uh, anybody have any other announcements? When's the next Lions Club blood drive? March 20. Eighth, yeah. March 28th. March 28th is the next Lions Club blood drive, 2 to 8 at Windsor Station, down to Fire Hall. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that.
work session. Uh, next work session uh, will be on uh, Tuesday the 19th. It will be brought to the Shoe uh, Department. Okay, 7 o'clock. No, well, if there's no other business, motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second for adjournment. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.